So I know we've done this before, but still, like, can you introduce yourself for the coaches and uh, therapists in Taiwan? Yeah, sure. My name is Irvin Sheck Snyder. My nickname is Boo, so most people call me Boo Sheck Snyder. Uh, I live in Louisiana in the United States, and uh, I've kind of made a career as a track and field coach with a, a fairly good amount of success nationally and internationally. And I also uh, do consulting work with a lot of college and professional sports programs on topics like speed, power, um, rehabilitation, and those types of things. So, so basically, that's my background. I've been coaching and consulting for about 42 years. 42 years. I was like coaching like five or six years old. <laughs> Long way to go. So our last conversation, uh, coaches here love it. And I received a lot of like messages asking about like, uh, how would you program for track? So today I'm probably, we're probably going to focusing on track a lot more. Okay. Sure. Up for whatever you, uh, whatever your listeners need. So the first question is uh, for uh, whatever is track coach or like performance coach, how should we build up for like acceleration? Yeah. When I, when I look at key, teaching acceleration, I really think there are only really two basic concepts. I, I try to, um, when I look at the technical side of acceleration, I try to keep it as simple as possible. The first is the start, meaning, you know, you have to teach the start well, because if the start um, puts you in the correct positions, then typically the acceleration pattern progresses naturally very well. Uh, and a compromised start or a poor start makes it very difficult to accelerate properly. So I work hard on the start. And the other thing that I look hard at are the, the um, progression in body angles. You know, I look for the progression of the torso. Uh, as the foot touches the ground, the angle of the shin is very important because that dictates the, uh, the angle at which forces are being applied. And I look at the angle of the shin. And more importantly than anything else, I look to be sure that the angle of the shin and the angle of the torso um, stay the same throughout the acceleration process. And most importantly, that the angle of the torso never rises above the angle of the shin. You know, one of the most, probably the single most important technical aspect of acceleration, uh, particularly with younger athletes, is the achievement of good posture, the ability to get the pelvis to a neutral position, the ability to get the pelvis in alignment. And that means that the head, the spine, and the pelvis, as, they, as we accelerate, all have to change uh, alignments. They all have to change angles at the same rate. And what I've noticed so many young people doing is partway through the acceleration process, they'll lift the head and lift the chest. So now you have the head and the chest up, but the pelvis is tilted down and the pelvis ends up in a position of anterior tilt. And as a result of that, you get a lot of injuries, you get excessive backside mechanics, a lot of plantar flexion in the run and so forth. So I teach athletes, the only real drill I ever use in acceleration is I might have them lean against a wall and, and kind of push with their feet and feel themselves changing body angles uh, against that wall so that they can kind of apply it when they run. Other than that, I really don't do many drills. Our main work for acceleration is to accelerate itself. You know, the acceleration itself is the drill. So I typically start athletes off at the beginning of the year, particularly the young ones, with real short accelerations of about 10 meters or so. After doing some 10s, and we progress to 20 and then 30, you know, so we just add length. And by adding length, of course, you're adding intensity as well, because each step in the acceleration process is faster and, and has greater levels of tissue load than, than the earlier steps. So, so basically, if I were coaching you, say, and you were a novice sprinter, I would probably have a workout like 410s, 420s, and 430s. And that would be the first workout we would do with you. On the other hand, uh, maybe a month later, we may do 420s, 430s, 440s. I typically limit my acceleration work to about 40 meters because for most athletes, at, at most, most athletes, that's around the point in time where they start to approach or get very close to maximal velocity. That isn't true for very elite people, but for, for most athletes, it's typically true. The last thing I do, if you would consider it a drill, would be resisted acceleration. I like to employ uh, light sleds uh, every so often uh, in the acceleration process. The sleds 
uh, put a little bit of resistance. And contrary to popular belief, a lot of people feel that if you add resistance, mechanics break down. But in my experience, the mechanics actually get better. People find better pushing angles and better body positions when you supply the load. So it's a nice way to, um, to, to, to vary that training stimulus just a little bit. You know, motor learning people always tell us that to perfect the skill, you want to practice various subtle variations of a skill. And that's why I like to use those light sleds. In general preparation, I typically do acceleration development maybe twice a week. Uh, once is resisted and once is not. And then I typically do it at least once a week uh, for the remainder of the season from the specific prep all the way until the final competition. So for the lights that you mentioned, how heavy you would you go? The uh, I think the most I ever have, have most I ever do under normal circumstances would be about okay. maybe uh, seven or eight kilos, seven or eight kilograms would be the most I ever do. So it's not very heavy. It's not very heavy at all. That includes the weight of the sled, by the way. Okay, so it's it's probably like pretty easy for track athletes, right? Yeah, it's not that difficult. You know, it, it, it does. I when I do my sled work, what I, I want them to be no more than about 10 percent slower than they would be without the resistance. So, uh, again, you know, to, in order to get some kind of skill transfer, you have to have um, subtle variations, not extreme variations. So if the sled gets too heavy, well, you might still be getting the power development and the strength development out of it but I don't find the transfer into the skill um, is as good. You don't, you, you don't get the skill development that you would want. Cool. So how about, how about like drills, like uh, uh, for the warm up like a escape, like a escape or bounding, how would you build up a like warm up for the acceleration session? I don't necessarily feel that there um, the, the, you have to have a technical match between the two. I think that the warm up is more about preparing an athlete for the intensity of the session. So I like to start them off with dynamic stretches and sprint drills of different types. And the way I look at the intensity is not so much with the speed of movement. The way I look at the intensity is the ballistic nature of the exercise. So to me, if an exercise like an air skip is fairly slow, but that exercise at the same time uh, uses big ranges of motion. When you reach the end of the range of motion, there's a big stretch on the tissues. So the tissues are being loaded at a pretty high level there. So I look at the degree of tissue load more than the, um, than the, the speed of the movement as being the measure of the intensity of the warm up. So typically I employ those types of exercises. I try to do them as loosely and as ballistically as possible, uh, not necessarily fast, but with big open movements and big ranges of motion. And then when it's over with, then we'll do some buildups that kind of progress to 100% in preparation for the uh, for the acceleration session. Cool. So that's for like uh, acceleration. How about like uh, things for max speed? When I look at teaching max velocity, I don't actually bring maximal velocity into my program until specific prep. So general preparation, we don't address it directly. I, I feel that the acceleration development is necessary to prepare athletes for maximal velocity work in two ways. The acceleration development supplies high levels of tension to those tissues. So it serves as an injury preventative before you start to do your uh, acceleration work. And it also, the acceleration work that you do in general prep improves rate coding. It improves the nervous system's ability to activate muscle tissue. And that is necessary before you actually undertake speed development. I think a lot of people undertake speed development. I shouldn't say a lot, but there's some who probably undertake it too early. And I'm not saying that it really did any damage, but it isn't as effective because the body hasn't been prepared quite properly for it at that, at that point. So in short, to me, the primary preparation for max speed is the acceleration you do. And I try to do at least a few weeks of acceleration before I would train maximal velocity. Now, the one exception to this is I like to do stadium runs. I'll find a, a, a set of stairs. And uh, what I'll do is I'll have the athletes run up the stairs. 
uh, and they have to touch every stair. If they touch every stair, their postures are gonna be upright. And if they touch every stair, the direction of push is predominantly vertical, which of course is the characteristics of maximal velocity, upright postures and vertical pushing. So I start to teach the concepts, the mechanics of maximal velocity by doing those stadium runs. Those stadium runs are not really long stadium runs. They're not being done so much for fitness. They're being done more for technique purposes. Now, some coaches like to use wickets in a similar way, you know, wickets, uh, to teach the mechanics of maximal velocity before you actually undertake maximal velocity. I prefer not to use wickets. That's just my personal preference, you know, because I, I think of sprinting as pushing against the ground. Wickets kind of put a premium or, or emphasize more the recovery mechanics or the lifting off of the ground. So that's why I'm not a huge fan of wickets. I'm not saying that, that you can't be successful with them and I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but I'm just saying that that's my personal philosophy and it's working for me. So I've never really gotten into the wickets too much. So then of course, the next thing to do is to actually teach the max velocity, you know, to put them in max velocity situations. Um, I am a, you know, when I look at max velocity training structures, um, I basically am concerned with two key factors. The first one is, at what point in a sprint does an athlete achieve maximal velocity? And secondly, um, athletes can attain max velocity and hold it for about three seconds. So I don't want any deceleration to take place. So basically what I'm trying to do is choose distances that will bring an athlete to max velocity and keep them there for a period of time less than three seconds. So, so for example, uh, if I think an athlete hits max velocity at 40, I might have them sprint 60 because 60 would be 20 extra meters. 20 extra meters is roughly about two seconds. So I'm bringing an athlete to max velocity uh, and I'm keeping them there after that max velocity point of about maybe an extra two seconds or so. Now, my favorite way to teach max velocity or train max velocity is with variable speed runs. Then my favorite construct is to use a sprint float sprint. I'll do something like this. I'll I'll put a cone at say 50 meters, a cone at say 70 meters, and then a cone at a marker at 90 meters. And assuming that the athlete touches max velocity at 40 meters, I'll have them sprint maximally to that first cone. And of course they hit max velocity at 40, which means that from 40 to 50, that's a one second window of maximum velocity. Then from 50 to 70, they relax very, very slightly, maybe sprinting at 95% or so. And then from 70 to 90, they're sprinting maximally again for about 20 meters, which is about two seconds. So within the context of one run, we've had two maximal velocity windows, one of about a second in length, one of about two seconds in length. So it's a very efficient time construct. Also, another nice thing about it is that it's a little bit more technically complicated than, uh, than, um, than, than the, the simple sprints. You know, one time a, a sprint coach called me up and um, he told me he was using, this is a really good sprint coach, one of the ones that whose names you would probably recognize, told me he was using my sprint float sprint constructs. And he was troubled because in the second sprint segment, at the end of the run, the athletes were having a little bit of difficulty showing really good maximal velocity mechanics. And this was bothering him. And my response to him was, no, that's exactly why you do it. You do it because it is a challenge to them and it is difficult for them to achieve good maximal velocity mechanics at the end. So as long as you're not going too long with that segment and putting them in jeopardy, and as long as you're coaching hard to improve them, then basically that's where you get your work done. I just think that if, you know, to use the example of the 60 that I discussed earlier, I just think it's too easy to achieve maximal velocity and keep the mechanics together for 20 meters. I don't think that's much of a challenge, which is why I prefer the sprint float sprint model. Now, if you're dealing with athletes who aren't really sprint types, you know, maybe they're not sprinters or jumpers, and maybe you want to sprint the throwers, maybe you want to sprint a shot putter uh, and, and achieve speed development with them for training purposes. Well, obviously a 90 meter sprint flow sprint might not be safe for a person of that body type. So that 60 construct or so whatever would work well for them. But the, the, I guess the last thing I should say Eric, is that the, um, you also have to individualize this. You know, I, I mentioned 40 meters as a point at which 
athletes achieve maximal velocity. And that's true for many, many athletes, but more developmental ones, it might be less. So those numbers that I gave you, you might have to employ shorter runs. Uh, those athletes, though, there are some athletes, elite level sprinters, who may not achieve maximal velocity until 55 meters or so. So you may have to lengthen things. So that's why it's important that you, I, I always say, if you understand about approximately where your athlete achieves max velocity and you understand the, the three second window, well, then basically you've, you, you can train any athlete at any level effectively. Well, uh, so is that, just to clarify, is that most of the athlete only can contain three seconds of max velocity? It's remarkably consistent throughout the population from developmental up to elite. You know, if you take a developmental athlete, a developmental athlete can achieve their max velocity holding for three seconds. If you look at a great sprinter like Usain Bolt at his best, he can achieve max velocity and hold it for three seconds. Now, now you might think, well, how could that be the case? Usain Bolt is a much better athlete, but you have to understand Usain Bolt's moving much faster. So the coordination demands at high speeds for Usain Bolt are much greater than that younger athlete. So it's remarkable how that three second window holds true from the very lowest levels of the sport to the very highest levels of the sport. But, but like, Usain Bolt is kind of like, uh, he also runs a 200 meters, right? Correct. So that's three seconds also the same with 200 meters? It's true, yes. You know, so ultimately it's about, uh, and that's what sprint coaching models are all about. It's about understanding that window of max velocity that you have. How can I build momentum to best use it? And how can I resist deceleration once that three second window is effectively over? Cool. So how, if I'm gonna train my track guy, no matter it's like a, a 100 meter or like 200 meter sprinter, how can I like make sure when does he hit like max velocity? Most of the time, I think the eye test is good enough, you know? When, and, and what I, this is my typical rule is a lot of times you'll just know and you'll just see. But keep in mind, when, if you've taught the acceleration model correctly, when they're accelerating, the shin angles will be tilted, right? So you see that the foot touches the ground, the shins are tilted, and then the shin angles progress over time. Once the shin angles have progressed the vertical, typically there's another eight to 10 meters or so before an athlete achieves max velocity. So if you're, if you're kind of not sure about it and you don't have technology to help you, then watch the athlete when they achieve max, when they achieve vertical shin angles, uh, about 10, 10 meters past that point is normally approximately the place. And if you're not perfect, you, you'll still be fine. Is that, is there like any technology you use right now? No, I use what I just said, you know, just my eyes and I looked at shin angles. Now, I'm, of course, there is technology. I mean, you can set up speed traps of different types and there are God, so many different good training systems, I mean, uh, timing systems on the market that you could use and set up if you wanted to be absolutely sure. But that gets awkward sometimes. And also it can change as an athlete develops as well, you know, so just because you have that distance doesn't necessarily mean that distance is going to be the, the same either. But I, I, I'm out there and I just move the cones around. You know, if I see an athlete and it looks like they haven't quite achieved max velocity, I just move the cone down the track a little further. And if it looks like they might be fading a little in a, in a sprint zone, then I just move the cone a little closer. Cool. So since we only can hold the max velocity for like three seconds, how can I like try to extend the acceleration phase for my athlete? The extending the acceleration phase comes from training. A lot of coaches make the mistake of trying to lengthen the acceleration phase through technique. And that's a mistake because your, you know, the acceleration phase is a constant progression in body angles and it must be a constant progression in body angles. A very young developmental athlete 
might begin with a 45 degree body angle on the first step, which would probably be appropriate and might progress through the body angles completely in 30, 35 meters, a high level athlete that might be 55 meters or so. And so sometimes a coach will make the mistake. Again, I consider this a mistake of telling this young athlete, look, accelerate out to 55 meters, stay down, push longer, whatever. But ultimately what that does is that creates bad mechanics. This is where you get anterior pelvic tilt. This is where you get excessive back kick and so forth. So basically at that point in their development, they are what they are, you know? So, so the true way to lengthen the dry phase or the acceleration phase is through training. And this is why the acceleration development work is not just a technique work, it's a power training exercise. And that's why it's important. This is where the weight room comes into play. I think that the squat exor exercise and exercises like the squat are extremely important for developing the first 10 to 15 meters of the sprint. I think that the Olympic lifts like cleans and snatches are extremely important for extending the dry phase and for improving from 50 meters out to the end of max velocity. There's an old saying that I use from time to time and you know, when you're sprinting, pretty much you run your first 10 meters with your squat, you run your next 20 meters with your clean. And from that point on, you're pretty much a sprinter. So the weight room and, and of course the plyometric program also have a lot to do with this. So, so again, it's through training and through progression, predominantly not, and, and not progression necessarily in athlete speed levels, but progression in the athlete's power levels. That, that's how you are able to extend that over time. And of course there are tremendous advantages to extending out the acceleration phase that way. This is why all good sprinters have to lift and have to have this other form of training. You know, for example, if you look at the 100 meters, okay, so if you're a developmental athlete, a, a, a good but de still developmental type of athlete, let's assume that you achieve maximum velocity at 40 meters. Well, from 40 meters to 70, you're as fast as you can be. And then from 70, to, to the end of the race, you're basically decelerating. Hopefully not much, but yes, you are decelerating. On the other hand, if you take this athlete and you train them to the point where they can extend the acceleration phase to say maybe 55 meters, well then they extend the acceleration phase to 55 meters, then from 55 to about 85, maybe even 90 meters, they're at maximum velocity, which leaves only 10 or 15 meters of deceleration. You know, we all know in the 100 meters that the troublesome phase is the end of the race because that's when we start to break down and that's when we start to see deceleration. So if I'm capable of lengthening the, um, the acceleration phase and that pushes the max velocity phase down the track further, then the trouble part of the race becomes shorter. And that's, that's why really, that's why sprint times now are becoming so fantastic. And, you know, one of the reasons, you know, a lot of these really good sprinters are only showing 10 meters or five to 10 meters or so of deceleration at the end of the hundred meters, because they're so powerful and so effective at acceleration early in the race. Cool. cool. So, uh, so, uh, if like, then how was like, uh, you mentioned like you're going to work like two acceleration for a week, right? So how was the weekly layout for your track athlete? My track athletes in general preparation, typically Monday is an acceleration development day. And on that day, typically, uh, we also do uh, short horizontal bounds because they go well with acceleration, the common ground being horizontal force application. And then they go into the weight room for Olympic lifting. And that's typically like a squat day for us. Tuesday is normally restoration based kind of training, general strength work through circuits. It's work, but it's restoration based work general strength circuits, weight training circuits, things of that nature. Wednesday is normally, um, in general preparation, is normally some type of tempo workout. Um, most of the time we're training at distances that range from 100, no more than 200 meters, and typically about 1,200 total meters in a session, running at about maybe 75, 80% or something like that. Thursday is very much like Tuesday. It's a restoration-based day. Friday is our second acceleration day. Our second acceleration day is typically resisted. And um, on this day, this is the day when we typically would supplement plyometrics as well with vertically based plyometrics. And then Saturday is typically another running workout of some type, typically a tempo workout. 
or something along those lines. Now, when I go into specific preparation, the model morphs just a, a little bit. Monday pretty much keeps the same themes, uh, but we really work hard on squatting on Monday. Like if I have an athlete who I consider not strong enough yet, which most of them are, then that's the day that we really focus on leg work, like squats and things of that nature. Tuesday is restoration. Wednesday is some type of special endurance uh, workout. Thursday is restoration again. Friday is our critical training day. This is the day where I think athletes are really built. This is the day when they will do speed development. Uh, I have them do high level, high intensity plyometrics on that day. And that's also the day when we do heavy Olympic lifting. So that's a, that's a, that's a tough workout. That's the workout that really builds the athlete there. Now, a lot of program, and by the way, Saturday is another special endurance type of training day. Now, the, the reason why Friday, I know a lot of programs choose Monday and Thursday to do speed-based type of training. And, and, and this is personal, but I have the athletes do squats on Monday. And the squats on Monday uh, fatigue the legs, but they also fatigue the proprioceptors, the small organs in the muscle that are responsible for coordination and elasticity. They become fatigued as well. Typically, those proprioceptors are recovered by Thursday, but they supercompensate by Friday. You know, because of the fact that I took these proprioceptors and fatigued them on Monday, they're actually sharper on Friday. So I've always found that the Monday Friday system works a little better than the Monday Thursday system. And that's why I typically employ it in that in that uh, in that way. I find that on Thursday you're good, but on Friday you're a little bit better. You're a little sharper, you're feeling your body a little more. So basically the system is set up so that Monday we stimulate the athlete after a day off. Uh, we do the squat work we need to do through the middle of the week. You know, we cover some other bases that need to be hit. Friday is the day when we really train speed power at a very high level with the high intensity plyometric speed and Olympic lifting. And then Saturday again, of course, is another special endurance type of workout. So uh, how was the weekly value for the track look like for 100 meter sprinters? For a 100 meter sprinter? Yeah. Yeah, when, yeah, when I do an acceleration development session, most of the time the volume hovers around 300 meters, uh, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more, but somewhere around 300 meters or so for the most part. So it's not a really high volume type of session. And as athletes get older and better, I typically do a little less volume because they're producing more intensity. You know, if they're producing more intensity, I don't need to do as much volume. Uh, when I do the speed development uh, work on the Saturday, uh, I'm sorry, on the uh, Friday, uh, typically we're working with sprint float sprint constructs, as I described earlier. And normally we're working in the neighborhood of um, anywhere from three to five runs. More developmental people will typically do four or five of those. Really high level people, three is typically a lot. And of course, that's because the, the high level people produce far more intensity. Intensity is always a great substitute for volume. So it's not a high volume type of system. I'll tell you a little, a, a little story. I have a young lady that I'm coaching now, a very good long jumper who did very well in the world championships. And she was training with me. It was her first year with me. And on the training schedule were three 90 meter sprint float sprint efforts. So she looked at it and she looked at me and I could see there was doubt in her eyes. And I, I know what she was thinking. She was thinking, how am I going to make the Olympic Games if I'm only doing 390s? That's not enough, you know. But it was funny because after two, she couldn't go anymore. Like she was so she was literally laid out and couldn't move after two. So the, my point is, is that, you know, we think in terms of volume, but the quality of the training is really what's important. And after that, she understood perfectly, you know, how this was going to get her to the Olympic Games. So the quality is, is key. You know, another interesting uh, story is um, the, the sprint float sprint um, uh, uh, constructs that I discussed a few minutes ago. Um, there have been instances in our college program where we, we've had distance runners do them. So the distance runners come and we set up the cones and they'll do them and they'll do seven or eight of them. And they think they're wonderful because they could do seven or eight. And then I'll go up to them and I say, you failed 
well, what do you mean I failed, coach? I says, well, if you were really sprinting them hard, you could never do seven or eight, you know? And then it's interesting because as they get better and better at them, the quality goes up and they're not able to do more, they're able to do less, you know? So that's one of the key aspects of sprint program is just appreciating the, the volume, not that volume is not what you're ultimately after, it's the intensity and, and ultimately the level of intensity that you're capable of achieving is the level of performance that you can expect to see with these athletes in competition. Now, as far as those uh, workouts, I normally begin the year's general preparation with uh, tempo workouts in the 80% zone, just general preparatory stuff. And that's for a few weeks. But after that, everything I do is pretty specific. Uh, the tempo workouts that I do, uh, the most I ever do in a tempo session is 1200 total meters in a tempo session. And then when I progress to special endurance work, most of my special endurance work only have um, anywhere from three to five runs. Five runs in a special endurance workout or an intensive tempo workout are the most I'll ever do. And with high level athletes, typically it's more like three or four runs. I would rather do three or four really good runs with nice long rests than do five or six runs that don't give me the same level of, of quality. Most of my special endurance work for track athletes, even 100 meters, is ladder down type of work, meaning the first run is longer, the second run shorter, third run is the shortest. That way we can maintain power output and velocity throughout the whole workout. Just about every workout I do in special endurance is along those types of line and along those types of constructs, I guess I should say. Cool. So why uh, you put like circuit weight training at Tuesday and Thursday? The, the circuit weight training, and by the way, typically it's Tuesday and Saturday, actually, Sorry. sometimes mm -hmm. Thursday. But, uh, but the circuit weight training, uh, if you go into the weight room and use small muscle group exercises, and if you go lighter and do, say, sets of 10, okay, then what happens is these exercises stimulate the release of certain hormones. These hormones, serum growth hormones, serum testosterone levels elevate. And because of that, they foster restoration. So you actually not only have an endocrine system, a hormonal system that will support your speed training better, but you actually recover from exercise faster. You know, when I talk to young coaches, it's a very difficult concept for them to understand that you can actually work and you produce the effects of rest because you've done the work, but that's genuinely what actually happens in those situations. And the same thing is true with the medicine ball work and the uh, general strength work that we do. You know, we do medicine ball work because we need specific core training. We do general strength work to alleviate imbalances and improve coordination, but they also produce lactate and the lactate levels that they produce uh, contribute to our fitness. And they also help us with those uh, growth hormone levels as well. So I am a firm believer in understanding how hormones work in our bodies and using work to stimulate those hormones so that we are achieving restoration, not by taking days off, but we're achieving restoration through work. Cool. And another question about the weekly layout is I talk to a lot of like track coaches and they tend to put heavyweight training with a uh, acceleration day like what you just mentioned squat day on Monday and the day you also train acceler acceleration right so mm -hmm. why do you why you put like heavyweight training and acceleration day at the same day Okay. The philosophy is that after warming up, and most of the time, the day before has been an off day. And because there was an off day, the athletes are not stimulated. The nervous system is not stimulated. And we have to re-stimulate the nervous system. So what I do is I warm them up. We do acceleration development, not only for the purposes that we discussed earlier, but for nervous system stimulation. We do some basic plyometrics, horizontal bounds for stimulation. Then we do a light Olympic lift for stimulation. And all of this stimulates us and basically sets up the remainder of the week. Then we do the squat workout. Now, why the squat workout then? First of all, the squat workout goes very well then 
because that's not the best day to do something like speed development. You know, on the Monday, you aren't stimulated enough to do effective speed development. So coaches will typically, the best coaches will do the speed development later in the week after they've experienced stimulation. You know, sometimes you'll hear a coach say that you have to be wired to do speed development. That's what they're trying to say is that you have to be stimulated from a nervous system standpoint in order to do it. So Monday is basically a stimulation day. We know that we're going to do speed development later in the week. So if I place the squat workout on the Monday, then I have time to recover from it before I accomplish the speed development day later in the week. If I would say put the squat day, say in the middle of the week, well, then in that situation, I wouldn't have enough recovery time from the squat workout to effectively uh, do the speed workout. Now, another option would be to do the heavy squat day after the speed development work on the same day. But because of the fact that I have prepared the athlete to do that speed day, and I've practically peaked the athlete to peak on Friday for that really good speed power session, I don't want to waste that opportunity on something like squatting. I would rather do high quality plyometrics and I would rather do high quality uh, Olympic lifting in that session because it's much more functional. So it's basically about putting the squat session where it does the least damage and where we have an opportunity to recover from it. Yeah. So before the speed development, that that's you you just mentioned it's on Friday, right? Mm -hmm. So before the speed development, uh, what what would you do on Thursday? Thursday is typically a restoration day. Uh, normally on Thursday, there is a general strength work and medicine ball work. With young athletes, it might be a weight training session, no, not a weight, not a, uh, not a, gen, not a, a restoration based weight training session, a weight training circuit. So it's some type of restoration day. Uh, I don't want a day off because I don't want to lose the stimulation. But by doing the general strength and the med ball on that day, the athletes do experience restoration, but they don't lose the uh, nervous system stimulation that we've achieved earlier in the week. Cool. So last time we talked, you mentioned like a three-day or like two-day uh, model for like team sport athlete, right? Mm -hmm. so is that is that going to work on track athlete? Yeah, I use it all the time. And in some ways, it works better with track athletes, particularly the more experienced high level ones. Uh, when an athlete gets to the point, and, and I, I use these in this way, for example, typically in a three day rotation, day one is a stimulation day. So on day one, uh, they would go out, probably uh, warm up, except short accelerations, not high volumes of anything, but short accelerations. And after that, typically we would do um, some short horizontal bounds and Olympic lift. So it's a nervous system theme type of day. It's a power training day. And what it does, it stimulates the athlete in preparation for the key day, which is yet to come. Day two is normally the critical day. That's the speed development day with higher intensity plyometrics. And then if I Olympic lift it on the day before, then I'll probably do like a squat session or something like that at the end of that day. And then the third day is restoration based. This is the day when we would do body weight circuits, general strength, medicine ball, those types of activities. Then after we do those three days, the stimulation day, the training day, and the restoration day, then we typically would take a day off and then come back and reboot and continue that type of cycle. Cool. So I want to go back to the uh, max velocity. You mentioned that there's most people only like can maintain max velocity for like three seconds, right? Yeah. So since that, why why should we be training like sp speed endurance? Because if most people, most people, well, not most, all people can maintain max velocity for three seconds, okay? But after max velocity is done and that three-second window is over, some people will drop 5% per second 
after that. Some people will drop 2% per second after that. Some people might drop 10% per second after that. So the rate of decrease of the rate of degradation after is what you're actually training in speed endurance. Speed endurance is not about lengthening the three second window. It's been proven that that can't be done, but it does decrease the rate of fall off or the rate of degradation of speed once we have reached that three second window. You see those, um, those fall off, that degradation or that decrease in speed is predominantly coordination based. You know, you're moving the arms and legs at very high rates of speed and it becomes very difficult to, to um, it's difficult to uh, coordinate high speeds of movement for extended periods of time. So that's ultimately what you're training with speed endurance. We think of it as a, as a metabolic thing or a fitness thing, but it's really much more of a coordination type of training. Cool. The, uh, actually, this morning, I just trained the sprint flow sprint. But, oh, did you? Yeah. and But I only did it like uh, 60 meters, like 20 meter of acceleration and 20 meter float, and then max velocity for like 20 meters. Mm -hmm. And I actually only run like three sets. And I was out. I was like, so tired, <laughs> so burnt out. Yeah, couldn't think yeah. of anything. High quality training. You know, um, I don't know what kind of athlete you are at this stage in your career, but um, keep in mind now, if for genuine max velocity training, you have to achieve max velocity in that first segment. So just make sure that that first segment is long enough for you to achieve max velocity. I'm not putting any criticism on your coaching techniques that you're using with yourself there, but uh, I see this happen a lot. Like um, I'll say, okay, do 90 meter sprint flow sprints. And what will happen is the coach will break them up 30, 30, 30. Yeah. Because that's even, but 30 does not permit the athlete to achieve max velocity. So always make sure that the first segment is long enough to achieve maximum velocity. That's a mistake. Oh. A lot of coaches make in team sports is they, you know, they, they think they're training max velocity, but they're actually not because they didn't allow enough distance for the athlete to accelerate to max velocity. So the sprint flow sprint also, we also can use that for our like uh, team store athlete? Absolutely, yeah. Provided, of course, it's safe. You know, if it's a team sport athlete who has a big body type, it might not be safe, but... Um, yeah, absolutely. It works very, very, uh, it works very well. I use it with everyone who has a, you know, a slender type of build and I feel good about their uh, body type doing it. So, uh, if, I, if, if I'm going to train, like, if I'm going to, like, train my 100 meter sprint and I probably can accelerate like 30 or like 40 meter. So my sprint flow sprint probably should be longer, right? The first just a little bit, the, right. The first I try to make the first segment uh, ten meters longer than the point at which they achieve maximum velocity. Well, that's really hard. That's yeah. I don't know what kind of athlete you're working with, and I don't know what kind of athlete you are. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, with, so that's that's why most of the time in speed development. The first segment, if you're doing the sprint flow sprint construct, the, the first segment is going to take up probably more than half of the uh, distance. If you think about the 90 construct that I talked about a little bit earlier, that 90 construct, um, basically, you know, 50 was the first cone. That's more than half. Uh, and when I do when I do speed endurance work, you know, very late late in the season. I continue to use the sprint flow sprints, but um, that's the time when you want to challenge the three second window, you know? So for speed endurance, I might set up like a, something like a, an 80, 120, uh, 140 breakdown or something along those lines, you know? Cool. So last question before I let you go. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm, there's a lot of like coaches they are going to talk about, we should train uh, max velocity for, our team sport athlete but there's also some track coaches that mentioned that most of the most of the teams for athletes they most of their like on field sprinting is just acceleration so we shouldn't mm -hmm. train our teams for athlete 
max velocity, we should just only train like uh, acceleration and change of direction. So what mm -hmm. are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I disagree with the second group. Um, I think that every athlete should train maximal velocity. And let me explain why. Um, when you do maximal velocity training, um, there are three reasons why you do it, not just one. One reason why you would do maximal velocity training is to improve maximal velocity, to become faster, of course. Now, that's the obvious answer. But when you do maximal velocity training, the um, nervous system is stimulated to a higher level. Maximal velocity training will take the nervous system's rate coding capabilities, the nervous system's ability to activate muscle tissue to a much higher level. So maximal velocity training is not just about being faster. It's about the nervous system working better. And if the nervous system is working better, then it drives strength increases, acceleration increases, power increases, even coordination increases. And the third reason is because the speed development work that you do, the max velocity work, subjects the tissues to very high levels of tension. These high levels of tension serve as a strengthening agent, basically. So, the you know, so and you know this, Josh. Like, suppose we took one of these team sport athletes, and all they ever did was lift and acceleration. If I ever brought them to max velocity, the next day they would be very sore. And if they're sore, that's telling you that the tension levels that the muscle tissue felt, the tension levels, the muscle tissue and the connective tissue experience was higher than it was with the weight lifting and the acceleration. So if the tension levels are higher, that means there is potential there for strength development. So, you know, we've always thought in terms of, you know, get stronger to be faster, but it also works the other way around. So I think that if you're a team sport athlete and you're not touching or training max velocity, then you have wasted the opportunity to improve the nervous system and you've wasted the opportunity to drive these additional strength increases through these higher levels of tension. I, there was a time in my life when I was working with a lot of volleyball players and volleyball players never run. You know, they maybe three or four steps at the most, of course. And I was doing speed development with the volleyball player. And the volleyball coach was very like that group of coaches you were discussing who didn't really understand why you would do speed development with these young athletes who don't ever touch max velocity in their games. But the speed development work stimulated their nervous systems. It produced very high levels of tension in the patellar tendon, in the Achilles unit, and so forth. And their vertical jumps as a result went up significantly, went up several centimeters. Uh, even, you know, so, so we have to think of specificity not so much as what the sport looks like. We have to think of specificity as what's going on with the nervous system and what's going on at the tissue level. We're concerned with tissue level specificity and biochemical specificity, not necessarily just the appearance of the sport. Yeah, last thing I know, I I know I said the last question is the last question, but one last question. Sorry about that. It's okay. Is like you mentioned, like the things you're gonna be looking at when you train uh acceleration. How about the things you're gonna be looking at when you train max velocity? At max velocity, predominantly the factors. Um, number one is posture, meaning a nice vertical posture with the pelvis at neutral position. The second thing is the idea of stability, making sure that the center of mass, I'm sorry, the foot touches under the center of mass. So that maintains posture if you have the proper relationships between um, uh, center of mass and base of support. Third thing that I look at constantly is the amplitude of movement, making sure that the athlete's moving through big ranges of movement. Sometimes athletes start to try to quicken up excessively and as a result, their ranges of movement get smaller. So I look to make sure that the knee is coming up nice and high, but I also look to make sure that when the thigh is pushed back, that it pushes back through a full range of motion. And at the end of that range of motion, I wanna see the thigh maybe 10 degrees or 15 degrees behind vertical. So I, I like to see the thigh, the, the femur, the thigh bone moving through a big range of motion throughout. And at no point in time do I want those things compromised. So in short, those are the key three 
key things, relationship between the base of support and the center of mass, looking at postural alignment, particularly the pelvis, and then making sure that amplitude of movement, range of motion is not compromised. Yeah, appreciate it. Appreciate it, coach. I know I send you a list. To you. I know I send you a list of the question, but I didn't follow that. Sorry about that. Not a problem. As long as I kind of know what to prepare for and have a general idea, we're fine. And, and even if you ask me a question that I'm not prepared for and I don't know the answer, I'll just tell you I don't know. But anyhow, this was a good conversation today. I appreciate the uh, uh, I appreciate the fact that you uh, you asked me to do this. Yeah. So if there's like coaches or like uh, therapists that are interested in what we're talking about today, where can they reach out to you? Um, you my personal email is b s c h e x at s a c s p e e d dot com b shex at saxspeed dot com or you can uh, email me through my website uh, saxspeed dot com s a c stands for shex Snyder athletic consulting s a c the word speed dot com and that's how you can track me down and if you Google me I'm sure you'll be able to track down my email address as well. So I welcome your listeners to contact me anytime. Appreciate it.